he wrote, um, gender queer people are gaining increased visibility within a society that doesn't legally recognize our existence, but we are still a minority within a minority. The talk will explore the social, economic, and health aspects of living outside the gender binary in the USA. Um, I will also share from my own coming of gender story as we begin a broader dialogue. What can the humanist community do to create a society where people of all genders flourish? And Assembly is an active member of the LGBT Center of St. Louis, the Metro Trans Umbrella Group, and the greater online community of non-binary trans and genderqueer folk everywhere. Please welcome Andy. Society of St. Louis. Oh, yeah, thank you. And it's much nicer to be on the level with you all than a high platform <laughs> appearing down from above. It's very personal, so it's nice to see this arrangement here. I've never been here before, and it's great. Um, I wrote a little speech, but of course, very informal. Um, I hear those questions and answers afterward. I'll be happy to take them. So the way you live without gender is you look for where gender is, and then you go somewhere else. I am the face that gender queer wants you to see. Let me rephrase that. I am the face that you are willing to accept, that society is willing to accept, as the proper vessel for my message this morning. I am a white, thin, educated, young person of female history. I'm wearing a bow tie. Bow ties are cool. <laughs> Bonus points on your next tour tonight. Uh, the sweater vest that I made is the colors of the gender queer flag of lavender and sage and white. But what if my body were tall, angular, my hair tied back to reveal an Adam's apple, lipstick applied expertly beneath a mustache? little back dress with a low-cut neckline that plunges down a flat chest. If you were to see that body walking down the street, that would probably strike most people as the punchline to a Monty Python cross-dressing skit, more than a proud, genderqueer person of male history. People like that don't get to use restrooms in public peace, have equal employment opportunities, be treated with dignity by medical professionals. Mothers shoo their children away from people like that, as my friends can sadly attest. Add color to that person's skin. They're quickly demoted in the public eye to streetwalker, because what else could they be doing dressed that way? Perhaps their body's found dead, and the police closed the case because nobody important was killed, only a black gay sex worker. My dramatic hypo hy hypotheticals are no exaggeration either. During the first week of November, before I gave a previous version of this talk in St. Louis, a 13-year-old boy was suspended for wearing a purse to school. Also that week, an agender teenager fell asleep on the bus in California, only to have somebody set fire to the skirt they were wearing in a self-professed crime of homophobia. Last summer, the murder rate of transgender people increased to twice that of gays and lesbians, despite total numbers of trans people in the population being much smaller than cisgender LGB people. And by cisgender, I mean people who are not transgender, so most people in here. This, dear humanists, is the violence of genderqueer invisibility. That which is hidden in the shadows can be dehumanized without recourse. Of the 6,450 people who responded to a 2008 National Transgender Discrimination Survey, nearly one-eighth of those people identified as a gender not listed here. That is, their gender is neither man nor woman. I want to quick, take a quick moment to point out that this number does not include transgender men and women as trans men and women are men and women. So this is other genders. According to that survey, the genders not listed here 
have significantly higher educational attainment than our binary trans peers who did not have to write in their gender. Nonetheless, the genders not listed here are living in the lowest household income category at a much higher rate than our binary trans brothers and sisters. We skew much poorer and younger. Of particular note to us here in the St. Louis area, respondents in the Midwest and the South were less likely to identify as a non-binary gender. I can tell you from my personal experiences interacting with hundreds of genderqueer people online, that regional disparity is a direct result of the necessity to fit into a binary box for survival in places that are not tolerant of gender diversity. In much the same way that living in the Midwest gives us pause to living our authentic selves, coming of age in an era where we have access to internet communities of others like us can also give us strength to know we're not alone. But what is the cost of authenticity? Referring again to the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, non-binary and genderqueer people are more likely to avoid medical care for fear of discrimination and as a result, are more likely to not know our HIV status, and when we do know, our HIV positive status is at a higher rate than other trans people. We're more likely to avoid help from the police because we're more likely to be harassed by the police. We're more likely to have been sexually assaulted at any point of our lives, including childhood. We're less likely to have lost a job due to bias, but we're more likely to seek a job in the underground economy in the first place. And perhaps not surprisingly after all this, we're more likely to have attempted suicide than our binary trans brothers and sisters. We keep waiting to be seen, to be heard, to be told that our rights matter and our humanity is valid. When Don't Ask, Don't Tell was struck down, Dan Savage announced that transgender people could now serve openly. This assessment was sadly incorrect, and the trans members who serve in our military at twice the rate of cisgender people were forgotten. Our pleas for justice drowned out by the celebration for the LGB people. Two years later, and Chelsea Manning still has to claw her way to basic access to female appropriate health care. In 33 states, and I'm pleased to announce this number was 34 in November, so it's gone down, but in 33 states, uh, we, we, it's still legal to discriminate against transgender people in the workforce. Several of those states have protections for sexual orientation, such as Missouri affords those LGB people working in the public sector. But when trans people ask to be included, we're told to wait our turn, and we're still waiting. On November 7th, the U.S. Senate passed the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, or ENDA, which would provide employment protections on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. ENDA has been introduced almost every year since 1994, and similar bills have as well going back to 1974. In 2007, protections for trans people were finally added, only to be dropped again to give the bill a better chance of passing. This year is the first time the bill has passed in the Chamber of Congress, which included protections for LGB and T. However, the House hasn't even touched it, so we're still waiting for its passage to protect the equal access of employment rights for trans workers in the entire United States. And it still wouldn't address many of the other much-needed protections we need in addition to employment rights. So the way you go, or the way you live without gender, is you look for where gender is, and then you go somewhere else. When I first read that statement by Kate Bornstein, mother superior of all trans people, I was struck by both the profound necessity for me to follow that path, and by the sheer impossibility to do so successfully. The way you live without gender is you look for where gender is, and then you go somewhere else. So which pronouns do you prefer, I am asked, as is the right thing to do when in doubt? It doesn't matter, I used to lie. Afraid I'd be accused of trying to change the world. Oh, you should definitely call me by gender neutral pronouns, I would say. Enthusiastic, I found somebody to change the world with me. Well, using he is fine, I now admit, having grown weary of trying to change the world by myself. <laughs> the way you live without gender is you look for where gender is, and then you go somewhere else. I stand with my young child and face two doors, knowing that what I need can be found behind both, aware that choosing one or the other is to publicly declare my deepest political allegiances. 
casually make my way through door number one, hoping no one will notice. Sir, I look up, and realize she's looking directly at me. I've been found out. <laughs> Sir, you want to go over there? She commands as she points toward door number two, valiantly defending the innocence of the flock of preschool girls we're both surrounded by. <laughs> well, me and my son go into the other room without a fuss. My child peers into a nearby urinal with suspicion. Mommy, what? I swiftly brush him in the nearest stall before he can utter any more incriminating words. Not knowing how to explain to a preschooler, there's no door number three for people like me. One thing I found as I began navigating society from an explicitly gender career frame of reference was that if there were any role models, they were rare to be found. In looking into the history of the movement, I discovered that this was because the genderqueer community, by that name, was barely reaching two decades in age. This isn't to say we just invented the concept. I know genderqueer people in their 50s and beyond. But as a self-named political and social movement, we're just getting started. So who are our role models? Where can we find clues on where we've come from to help ground us as we look forward to where we're going? When I first tried to answer this question years ago, I was hoping to find binders full of genderqueers all over the internet. <coughs> mostly found were androgynous fashion heroes like David Bowie and Tilda Swinton. I felt like I was floundering for a bit. You mean we have to figure this out all on our own? Oh, yes. Early October 2011, I attended a platform address by Kate Lovelady, leader of the St. Louis Medical Society, titled The Leaders We've Been Waiting For. The description on the podcast page merely describes it as new ideas gathered in her sabbatical. But I'm going to spoil the ending for you in case you go to listen to it online. We are the leaders we've been waiting for. And it all seems so warm and inspirational at the time, but I've made the connection after a while that this is what the gender queer community is always already doing. We look around, wondering who's going to take this movement out of our hands and take it where it needs to go. And as we search, we see the faces of our siblings looking back at us. It's always been us going where gender isn't together. So who are we? What are the human faces of genderqueer? Let me start with some of the more creative responses given by those genders not listed here when allowed to write in their own on the survey I mentioned earlier. Gender rebel, best of both. Just me, Burl, spelled like a mix of boy and girl. And my personal favorite, Tranny Dyke Genderqueer Wombat Fantastica. <laughs> I also conducted my own survey in preparation for today. I wanted to know what genderqueer people have to say to humanists, what you are encouraged to see in us, what you can take initiative to do for us. I got a couple dozen responses, which you can read in more detail on my blog entitled Nerd is My Gender. I can write up there later if you want. The responses were as varied as the individuals who responded, but a couple a common thread ran throughout. A plea for society and the humanist community to stop precluding our existence. Imagine, if you would, in a matter of daily life, that when you introduced yourself to people, they responded with, oh, well, what did your parents name you? Instead of a friendly, nice to meet you. Or what if you said, you got married, and they responded, well, well what state were you married in? Or, is your husband gay? <laughs> Rather than a hearty congratulations. Imagine if you lived in a world where essentially you don't exist to most people, and then you decide to be brave or stubborn enough to keep digging your heels in the sand and say, no, you don't have a space on your form for my gender, or no, you don't have a restroom for my gender, although this location does have a restroom for my gender. <laughs> or no, your laws don't include people like me. Or Yes, I do need access to that medical treatment. Or yes, that is my real name. Imagine if you had to keep doing that over and over again. Every time you met a new person at the Ethical Society, the DMV, the Shop and Save. Often, with people you've known for months or years too, who suddenly develop pronoun amnesia when they're around you. And then, you have to get up the next morning and find a reason to face all that again. To not join the 41% of us who attempt suicide in our lifetime. One of the more important things we can do to take gender diversity for granted, the one that's surprisingly easy for everyone to fulfill, is to make the gender option on forms of fill in the blank. I'll point out that Facebook recently introduced an expanded list you can choose from 50-some sex and gender options. 
and there was much rejoicing. Every time your form says, check one, M or F, a kitten dies. <laughs> Stop erasing us. Instead of the select one, Mr., Mrs., Miss, Dr., Reverend, etc., make it a fill in the blank. If every option were available, if every option available to me is going to be a lie, I might as well pick the most fun lie. Dr. Semler, Reverend Semler, the Honorable Semler. That's my to it. And I'll have you know, the St. Louis Ethical Society member directory is literally the only place on the entire internet where I've encountered a pure fill-in-the-blank option. I get mail from the society delivered to Mix Andy Semler, and it makes my day. Mix. Spelled M-X. Mix. Oh. Another common thread among stereo respondents was to please be proactive in making our community safe for gender diversity. Have explicit gender, inclu gender inclusive policies already in place before even the first person complains about the issue. It's going to take a while before some of us trust you enough to admit we're not living life inside the gender binary. For most of us, this is why we need a sign to feel safe before we out ourselves as genderqueer. We wait until we hear the code words of inclusivity. One example of how you can do this is to be explicit that anyone can use whichever restroom they feel comfortable using, despite their physical appearance or whatever you suspect they may have hiding under their clothes. <laughs> and make sure the members who frequent the establishment are aware of that, so they're not surprised. If you have single-user restrooms, you don't have to label them with the gender. Try not to insert gender, gender labels into any other places or events either, if it's not absolutely necessary. Insert inclusive language into your casual conversation, such as saying, this activity is for all genders, or the more simple, this activity is for everyone, instead of the exclusive phrase, for boys and girls. If you have a men's club or a women's club, you can extend invitations to all people who wish to participate in a masculine or feminine space. We want to be written into your lives. And for some of us, this may be the first chance to finally feel recognized as fully human. The way you live without gender is you look for where gender is, and then you go somewhere else. So let that somewhere else be where you are, opening your arms to us. One of the happiest moments for me was when I sit down with my then six-year-old to explain to him I'm not a man or a woman, that my gender is queer, and he was excited. Sometimes you get to be a boy with me? Wow. Aww. We discussed that mommy and daddy are terms for women and men, and that we need a name for me that works for both of us. Now, I know a lot of parents say this, but I really do have the best kid in the world. He calls me <laughs> sweetie. <laughs> The way you live without gender is you look for where gender is, and then you go somewhere else. Kate Bornstein, in all her infinite wisdom, didn't quite get this one right for me, I think. The way I live with gender is I look for where gender is, and then I go where I am loved. For you engaging audience, I hear this question and answer right now. Around afterward, if you something occurs to you later. Well, I, my first thought is, is being as a mom. Mm -hmm. Did you come out to your family? How do they take it? They are conservative Christians, and all right. as you would expect, mm -hmm. um, it's it's a constant. It's a constant. Um, not exactly a dialogue. They <laughs> try, but they also don't. And it kind of depends on if they have their fundamentalist switch in on mode when I'm talking to them or not. Mm -hmm. So I, I've gotten all manner of them being proud of me in front of the friends and other members of the family to even just belittling or making fun of me depending on the situation. Um, I. Trying to understand, and uh, from your point of view, do you? Um, I don't even know how to how to ask the question. You know, for people who are uh, what did you call it? 
Cisgender, S -I -S -C -I -S gender. And then it comes from chemistry. There's okay. trans molecules and cis molecules. Okay. So it's kind of nerdy and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess we we kind of feel. I don't know what. I'm, I don't know even. Maybe I shouldn't even be asking a question. But what I'm trying to find out is, what? How do you feel yourself is different from? Other people. I mean, are, are there certain areas that it, it, it varies from person to person? Because I mean, everyone obviously feels different about mm -hmm. being themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's hard to explain if it doesn't apply to you. Like I sometimes wonder how it would feel to be cisgender. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, different, I suppose. And there, there's no one satisfying answer, and I kind of have to tell people. Well, if it applied to you, you would know, and unfortunately, you don't know because it doesn't apply to you. Uh -huh. um, but it, it generally, for most people, it's it's persistent, lifelong feeling. And one of the problems we have in society with a lack of, of non-binary uh, visibility is that for children, they don't get to look at somebody and think that could be an option for me. So, like, as I was a child, I thought, well, the option for me doesn't exist. I, I must be the wrong one. It can't be everybody else. It has to be me. And it wasn't until I was older and saw that there were other people that I thought, you know, this, this isn't, this, this is something external to me now, something that I can see in front of me and see that I, I see myself in that person and I had never seen myself in a person before. And that's, that's how I came to understand who I am. How young were you uh, when you really realized that you were something other than what you were supposed to be? I think I was seven. Uh -huh. And at the time, it didn't really stick out because I didn't understand the significance of it. But looking back, like I tell people, most children apparently don't wonder if God makes mistakes in the gender yeah. that they were born as. Mm. Uh, but at the time, you know, I, I only had my own experience to identify with, so I just thought that was normal, and mm. and I didn't think much of it till later. Mm. So looking back through my childhood, I I didn't like form a collection of memories at the time that I knew were gonna be important later, so it's a little difficult to see. Mm. And I will point out that not everybody will necessarily have that moment or that um, omen in their past that reveals, you know, that they were going to identify as transgender or gender career later on in life. Mm -hmm. But in my case, I can look back and say, oh yeah, that makes sense now. Mm -hmm. I have a comment and a question. Um, this is the second time I've had the pleasure of hearing this talk. And after I heard it the first time, my takeaway was um, when you said that Something that we can do is not not talk about boys and girls. And as a chief, as a teacher for 30 years, that was language that I just automatically adopted from other teachers that became, you know, who were my mentors. And and I regret that now, and I I agree with that. And it's happening again today. It just why didn't I think of that? You know, 30 years ago. Yeah, but, you know, it's it's one of the things that why didn't I wouldn't have even as a child thought. Yeah, it just. Boys and girls like that, it's hindsight. Oh, that, it's so yeah. obvious now. So for those of us in this audience who still interact with kids, whether they're your own or the ones you work with or the ones you encounter casually, I just think that's such a simple but powerful thing to remember and just to change. So that was my comment. Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. or boys get in this group, girls get in that group. Yeah, yeah. Kind of the, when it's unnecessary. Understand there's certain times it's necessary, like when you have gender restrooms. Unfortunately, using children to change the world is not very welcome in most places. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have a question too. Would you just talk for a minute about the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity? Mm -hmm. Sexual orientation and gender identity, um, they are very intertwined with each other, especially in a society where your sexual orientation is defined as whether you're, the person you're attracted to is the same or different than yourself, which when suddenly yourself is not what it was originally assumed to be, 
your sexual orientation magically changes. It's, except in my case, because I, I identify as um, queer, as bisexual, or as basically just gender doesn't limit my choices. Um, so I didn't have that dramatic shift. But yes, sexual orientation is um, about the person that you, or persons that you would choose to be with and are attracted to. And gender identity is about yourself. And sometimes people, I think it's because the LGBT um, is thrown together, people kind of will assume that the T is also a sexual orientation. And it's not really. It's about the self and not about the relationship with the outside world as much. that there are certain phrases that help people um, who aren't familiar with these communities adapt to it? Um, that's a good question. And can you can you give like a specific um, well like for example if you're speaking with somebody like at a grocery store as you mentioned um, and the question comes up well you know like how would you get to be this way or Something like this. Is there can be found that there are certain phrases that you can go to that people identify better with because they're not as judgmental as people can tend to be? That um, if if you know one, let me know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you kind of you have to know the person first before, and unfortunately, that that just is a matter of personal experience and feeling it out, and it's <coughs> lots of. Discussions go on within queer communities about you know how can we best sell ourselves as not evil, and you know obviously that's a continual challenge for all of us. Mm. But that, that's a good question. I love your book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can kick me off when I'm taking too long. Though. No. So, with those differences that you explained um, between. lesbian versus gender queer, how comfortable do you feel in the LGBT community and how much do they address your issues, you know? Yeah. Um, it varies place to place because there's such a wide diversity among you know, like the LGBT community as there is among the street and cis community. So, I mean, at the LGBT Center of St. Louis, I have had no problems. People are wonderful. Um, I have had very few concerns with the way I'm treated at the Ethical Society because mostly people are like, of course, you know, why wouldn't I be affirming your humanity? Um, that's wonderful. Um, some, some lesbian and gay specific communities can be a little exclusive because they have had their culture entrenched over decades that they kind of ironically have a little conservative liberalism, if that makes sense. But I, again, I just don't go to those places and then I, I don't feel like taking them on and changing them. I just go to places where it's, it's more accepting Thank you very much.